The NFL trade deadline has passed and there was a lot of speculation as to what would happen when the day finally came and there were a few big trades. There were some other trades that I thought were going to happen, or at least specific players I thought would be on the move that ultimately remained with their team. And in today's video, we're going to break down both the biggest winners and losers from the NFL trade deadline. There's a lot that goes into it from a team and player perspective and ultimately the goal of the player being successful both on and off the field. We'll break down every angle of all the trades and what's next for the former teams of these players. Now let's begin. And we are starting today's video with one of the biggest winners from the trade deadline, and it's Chase Young of the 49ers. Chase has had an up-and-down career as he won the Defensive Rookie of the Year award back in 2020 as he was on his way to a 7.5 sack season in which he also had four forced fumbles. And over the next two years, Young would go on to play just 12 games as he had a notable sophomore slump in 2021 before his season prematurely came to an end with a season-ending knee injury. He would play just three games in 2022, and 2023 was going to be a big test for him. Was he a one-year wonder, or could he become a player that had Miles Garrett type pre-draft hype and proved to be worth the number two overall pick. Well, in seven games for the Commanders this year, he had five sacks, but what you may not know if you haven't paid attention to the Commanders is Chase also has 38 pressures in seven games, which ranks ninth in the league. Oh, and those 38 pressures in 2023 are just six behind Nick Bosa on 32 less pass rushing snaps. So for the 49ers to get a player like Chase Young for just a third round pick is an absolute steal and they too, like Chase, are big winners from the trade deadline. But they're not winners just because they acquired a good player and what could be a move to push them to a Super Bowl title. If Chase Young walks in free agency, which is very possible considering he will want to get paid like a top 10 pass rusher, which would be in the ballpark of $25 million plus per year, the 49ers will get a 2025 third round comp pick if Chase does not re-sign with the team. Finances are always tough in the NFL, and they're especially tough when you have to pay players like Trent Williams, Eric Armstead, Nick Bosa, George Kittle, Fred Warner, Debo Samuel, and Javon Hargrave. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if Chase Young walks. But because the 49ers get a third round comp pick in return, while sending a comp pick they received from losing Rand Carthon to the Titans, it's essentially a free rental of a Pro Bowl caliber player. And with how dominant the 49ers defensive line already is, combined with the fact Nick Bosa and Chase Young are teammates again after being teammates in college, I'm sure there's going to be somebody somewhere that's upset with this, but I don't see how there's any downside to the 49ers for making this move. They've lost three games in a row to the Browns, Vikings, and Bengals, and were beat by double digits in their stadium by the Bengals, by the way, and they took as low of a chance as you're ever going to find on a guy who could walk into a 13-sack season. The pass rush this team is going to have in the final nine games of the 2023 season, plus the playoff run, is going to be something no offensive line wants any part of. For Washington, I wasn't really the biggest fan of this trade, and I get that you were preparing for Chase to inevitably leave, but by trading both Chase Young and Montez Sweat shows where they're headed as a franchise. And we'll get to the Montez part in a minute, but I was pretty disappointed with allowing Chase to leave for a third round pick after everything you've invested in him since April of 2020. I get that we can do this with a lot of teams every year, but this franchise drafted Chase Young number two overall and less than four years later, flipped him for a measly compensatory third round pick while Justin Herbert and Tua Tagovailoa are playing great football. And I know the Lions probably think the same thing with Jeff Okuda given he was the immediate pick after Chase, but if you were going to get a comp pick anyway when Chase left, why not keep him for the remaining nine games of the 2023 season? Because all you have to do now is try and replace a guy who again is top 10 in pressure so far. Now, one of the biggest losers from the trade deadline is Raiders receiver Devontae Adams. The Raiders are 3-5 and five in the year, and their wins are over the Broncos, Packers, and Patriots, so it's not like the Raiders are killing it by any means, and they were embarrassed on national TV in Week 8 against the Lions. I don't want to say a 12-point loss is just a 12-point loss, but this game wasn't close, and the Raiders are pretty lucky that it was only a 12-point loss. 
They even had a pick six in this game defensively to kind of make the score look better than what it was. And the Raiders have put up just 19 offensive points in the last two games. And in the last two games, they've amassed just 392 yards of total offense, while Detroit in week eight against the Raiders put up 486 yards of total offense. And the reason Devontae is in today's video as one of the biggest losers is pretty simple. His career is wasting away in the desert. He will be 31 years old in December, and he is nowhere close to winning a Super Bowl. And in the midst of making this video, Josh McDaniels was fired, and I do want to credit the Raiders for finally getting rid of him, as it was long overdue. There were a couple of social media posts that said Devontae privately requested a change of scenery, to which the Raiders declined and say they were absolutely not taking any calls on Devontae. And in the Lions game specifically, the Raiders had seven plays in Lions territory over the course of a 60-minute game all of which came in their lone scoring drive. They went the entire first half without completing a pass to a receiver. And guys, we're in 2023, and to go an entire half without completing a pass to a receiver, even if it's the worst receiving core in the NFL, is inexcusable. And despite me killing the Raiders, their receiving core is pretty solid, all things considered. Their top two guys are, of course, Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers, but they also have Hunter Renfro. And when Devontae was traded to this team in the 2022 offseason, it was so he could be reunited with his former college teammate Derek Carr. And we've seen how that's went so far in the post-Derek Carr era, or how it hasn't went, and it's been abysmal. We saw Devontae's frustration during the Lions game, and you can't blame him. It's not hard to get a playmaker the football in today's NFL. Get him the ball in drag routes, slants, screens, any way you can, just get him the rock. He had at least six receptions in each of the first four games of the year, but has had six or more receptions in just one game since, which was a seven reception, 57 yard game against the Bears in what was an 18 point loss for the Raiders. This team is in one of the worst situations in all of football, and it's due in large part to their quarterback and now former head coach. Tay has just 14 receptions in the past four games, and if you are Devontae at this point in time, there's no way he's happy about this. You can say he's making however many millions, but you get one shot at an NFL career. And because of how the Raiders have handled the past few off seasons, they're wasting his career, or what's left of it. This team needs as much help as they can get, and as much young talent as they can get, and I don't understand why they didn't field any calls. Devontae has to stay on a bad team rather than go to a contender, and unfortunately, he is is one of the biggest losers from the trade deadline. Next up is the Chicago Bears, who I believe are winners from the trade deadline, and it's for a few different reasons. They acquired Montez Sweat for a second round pick, and I know a lot of people complained about this for the Bears initially, as they paid a pretty hefty price for a player on an expiring contract, but I think the Bears will work at a long-term deal with Sweat and keep him in Chicago for the next four or five years. And this is why I think the Bears should be considered winners. They traded a second round pick, and granted it will be a high second round pick, but they traded a second round pick for a player that will be a good starter for what will hopefully be the next half decade. And I know people get lost in the value of draft picks at times, and hell we all do, but if you go back to the 2019 draft, the draft Montez was in, and look at the first five picks of the second round, which we of course will do, there's only one player that's still on the team that drafted them. Granted, he is a pretty good player, but the point is the hit rate on second round picks is low, and when you're picking in the 33 through 37 range, which is where we can reasonably assume this pick will be, you are hoping a player can become Montez Sweat's caliber. The first three picks were Byron Murphy, who is now with the Vikings, Rock Yassin, who is with the Ravens, and Jawan Taylor, who is now with the Chiefs. The next two were receiver Debo Samuel and tackle Greg Little, who is currently not on an NFL roster. And even in the case of Debo Samuel, this is a player who has one career 1,000-yard season. Granted, he could probably be a 1,000-yard receiver in plenty of offenses across the NFL, but the point is the likelihood the Bears are missing out on a premier player from this position is low. And I think giving up a second round pick for Sweat is 100% worth it. Yes, you're going to have to pay him, but so what? It takes pass rushers a few years to truly develop, and Sweat has 35 and a half sacks over the first four and a half years of his career, including six and a half and eight games in 2023 alone. The Bears' pass rushing situation is drastically different than the Commanders, but this is a player who can generate north of 55 pressures per year while being a good run defender. Is Montez ever going to lead the league in sacks as a member of the Bears? 
No, but that's why they traded a second round pick for him. They didn't give up multiple first rounders for a guy who can get 8 to 11 sacks per year, along with 4 or 5 pressures per game. And the best news about this for Chicago is they still have two first round picks they can use to acquire a player like Caleb Williams if the Panthers pick ends up being the number one overall pick, or they trade back a singular spot and acquire another haul like they did with the Panthers to get two or three more first round picks and to acquire as many players as they can. Now, admittedly, that is a different discussion, but the point is the Bears will still probably have two top five picks, and the reality is they can still probably get a another first round pick next year by trading one of those picks while acquiring a pass rusher that will start for them for hopefully the next half decade. And for the, well, you have to pay him crowd, am I missing something? Do the Bears have a quarterback that they have to give a five-year, $300 million contract to at the moment? No, they don't. Sign Montez Sweat, and by not trading the next player we're going to discuss, I think they sign him to an extension too, and that's corner Jalen Johnson. And speaking of Jalen Johnson, I thought the Cowboys were somewhat losers at the trade deadline. Not big time losers and that this will completely alter their season, but I thought they should have went after a guy like Jalen. There were rumors that Johnson's asking price was far too high and that very well could have been the case, but I worry about Dallas' corner depth, especially with Trayvon Diggs done for the year. And if there's two positions in the NFL, you can never have enough depth, it's pass rush and corner. The Cowboys have the pass rush part more than figured out, of course, but I worry how they'll fare against a team like Philly, who they play this week, who has two great receivers in AJ Brown and Devonta Smith. We've already seen one corner go down for Dallas, and sometimes the NFL also stands for not for long. Deron Bland is having a great year, and I am happy for him, but I really would have liked to see Dallas make a push and go all in, especially given they're 5 and 2 and can still very much get the number one seed in the NFC. It is worth noting the Cowboys do not have any picks in rounds 4 through 6, but I was still surprised as much as Jerry talks about winning a Super Bowl and bringing Big D another Super Bowl, that he's content with this roster, that he thinks this is the Super Bowl winning roster. The Cowboys are so loaded with pass rush right now that I think they could have traded one of the depth guys and a future fifth and got something like a corner and a sixth back or something along these lines. Obviously that wouldn't have been Jalen Johnson, but a depth corner would have been nice. I just really worry about how this team's corners will play moving forward, especially if they're down to their third and fourth corners, and I hope for Dallas' sake that Micah, Osa Adigizua, Demarcus, and the rest of the bunch continue to get to the quarterback and fast, because if this team wants to win a Super Bowl, it's going to be on the pass rush. Given how bad of a situation the Minnesota Vikings were in, for them to only give up a 6th round pick while getting Josh Dobbs and a 7th round pick in return was great value for the team. They could have easily been fleeced given the situation, but in terms of grades, I would give the Josh Dobbs trade an A grade for Minnesota. We know he's not going to be league altering or anything, but hopefully he can lead this team to a wild card appearance and right the ship. And for a late round pick swap, I'm good with that every day of the week. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please like and subscribe, as only about 26% of people watching are subscribed, and your subscription is very much appreciated. Saturday's video will be a big one, and until then, please be safe, and have a great day. Love you guys.